thank you all for joining us tonight for a discussion on empire and progress and the history of secularism. First, I want to acknowledge that I live and work on the traditional ancestral and unceded territories of the Coquitlam First Nation. My name is Ian Bushfield and I'm the Executive Director of the BC Humanist Association. Tonight's event is with Patrick Corbet, an independent historian of atheism, secularization, secularism and secularization. He'll be speaking tonight about his new book, Empire and Progress in the Victorian Secular movement, imagining a secular world. Like all good academic books, it's a mouthful of a title. <laughs> no offense intended. No. The book looks at the role of empire in the development of free thought, particularly as secularism developed in Britain and its colonies, notably Canada for our purposes. For those who aren't familiar with humanism, it's a worldview that imagines a better world through free inquiry, the power of science and creative imagination. The term itself first rose to prominence in the early 20th century, but its ideas have roots much further back in history. Tonight, we'll learn a bit more about some of those movements that fed into humanism, and particularly modern humanism as we know it in Canada, during the Victorian era. But first, a few more housekeeping notes. Uh, you'll notice that all of your microphones have been muted. This is out of respect for everyone listening in, and I do ask that you try to keep those muted until the end when we'll have time for plenty of questions. Again, please hold your questions till the end. I'll try to moderate and recognize you either using virtual hands or just wave on the screen and I'll try and keep a speaker's list or put your questions in the chat and we'll try and make sure they get answered. We are recording tonight's talk and we'll try and share it on our YouTube channel and podcast in the future. So if you want, please share it later, but also recognize that it will be recorded. We don't always keep the questions in. So if you don't want your question recorded, just let us know. Finally, as a small charity, we rely entirely on donations to make all of our work and these events possible. If you're not a member yet, go to bchumanist.ca slash join to sign up or make a one-time or monthly donation at bchumanist.ca slash donate. On our website, you'll also find our new report that we just released on municipal prayers at Manitoba Municipal Councils titled In Open Defiance, where we chastise the city of Winnipeg for continuing to open its meetings with a prayer. We have many other forthcoming reports, and I encourage you to check out our website, bchumanist.ca, to keep up to date with all of our work. And with that, I will turn it over to tonight's guest, Patrick. Uh, hello. Thanks for having me. Um, so I'm over on the island, so I will add that I am uh, I live and work uh, on the unceded territories of the Lekwungen peoples, uh, of the uh, Songhees and Esquimalt First Nations. And... Um, um, I, I want to say thanks to Ian for inviting me and uh, thanks to all of you for uh, coming out tonight for a, uh, an online event in this period where I think many of us are very tired of online events, although despite them being still very rational things to do. Um, so yeah, uh, this is my first book. It is based on my doctoral dissertation that I wrote at Queen's University. Um, and the dissertation had an equally mouthful name that the publisher made me change for search engine optimization uh, reasons. So imagining a secular world initially was the title, but the, the, the publisher was like, well, please change that. So I did. Uh, but yeah, it is a bit of a mouthful of a title. Um, so as the title does suggest, uh, my focus in the book is the secularist movement. And just to sort of place that in a bit of context, um, secularism as a term was coined um, in around 1851, or it seems to first appear in 1851, by uh, the Owenite lecturer, cooperative movement leader, and secularist leader, George Jacob Holyoke. Um, and he had, through the 1840s, Holyoke had been sort of muddling around with trying to find a, a term to describe what he called positive free thought. And the general idea that Holyoke was looking to do was to take um, uh, free thought, which was mostly uh, associated with atheism, uh, and take it away from the rather immoral sense of atheistic negation that had become attached to it through the period of ultra radicalism in the particularly the 1820s, uh, and 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 try and construct a positive and more respectable form of free thought. Um, secularism as a movement uh, had its high period in the 1870s and 80s under the leadership of Charles Bradlaugh um, and Bradlaugh's National Secular Society, which was founded in the 1860s, um, was more, or at least Bradlaugh himself in particular, was more emphatically atheist. 
So there's kind of two wings in the movement. There's the, the more respectable and ecumenical Holyoke wing of the movement, which is uh, largely argues that you don't need to be an atheist to be a secularist and the more aggressively atheistic wing of the movement associated with Charles Bradlaugh. Um, uh, the, my book kind of deals with both wings and I, I, I make an argument for um, the importance of understanding the unity of secularism as a progressive universalist means of thinking. So I try to make some efforts to, to narrow the realm of the divisions between the two wings of the movement. Uh, but nevertheless, these divisions do exist. Um, and what I'm going to talk about today is largely concerned with the Holyoke wing of the movement. So the more ecumenical uh, side of things. So um, Holyoke's concept of a neutral secularism, secularism, pardon me, was premised on the idea uh, of, to quote from him, trust in science as the providence of man. And the belief that more that a morality guaranteed by human nature, utility, and intelligence could lead to progress. Um, so many in the movement don't subscribe to Holyoke's uh, notion of this sort of neutral secularism, but the universality of progress implied in Holyoke's appeal to human nature, utility, and intelligence was a common feature of organized free thought through the 19th century. Uh, and it's this appeal to the universality of progress, which really drove the creation of my book. Um, the background for it is uh, I, I started out doing uh, early modern and enlightenment history of atheism and kind of drifted into the 19th century between my MA and PhD. And I was really interested in questions of enlightenment universalism and, and some of the debates around enlightenment and empire um, that are lively debates in the scholarship these days. Um, and my aim with the project was to unpack the role of, that the imperial world played in shaping the secularist vision of progressive reform. Um, what I found was that the secularist press regularly took notice of Britain's overseas empire, um, and that the religious diversity of the empire furnished free thinkers with material with which to criticize Christianity and to justify their demands for progressive secular reforms in Britain. And in turn, that secularism's universalist vision of scientific progress gave them a lens with which they could look out at the empire and make judgments uh, about the potential for progress among the colonized peoples of the empire. So as I argue, secularism was an outward looking project of ethical and political reform. Um, and it was rooted in an older artisan tradition reaching back you know, many decades, but uh, most commonly we root it in the, the period of radical reform that begins at the end of the 18th century with figures like Thomas Paine. Uh, so the republicanism and rationalism of that project, uh, a politics of civil libertarianism, and especially with the earliest generation of uh, the secularist movement, heavy involvement in Owenite socialism. So many of the figures of this movement come out of um, uh, Robert Owen's political organizing in the 18 teens, 20s, and 30s. Um, and I, I think they get, some of the, uh, they get some major intellectual baggage from it. Um, ultimately, despite that sort of early English socialism connection, the, the movement is largely a liberal movement, uh, especially by the end of the century. They're strongly Gladstonian liberals. So um, many of the, the uh, leadership of the free th uh, the secularist movement are quite skeptical of the labor movement and Marxist socialism at the end of the 20th or at the end of the 19th and start of the 20th century. Um, so and and I think one of the way things to think about this movement is that it is really heavily emphasizes the individual uh, and the capacity of one individual's reason, um, and that's I think why the Gladstonian liberalism appeals so much. So. Um, Secularism was a vision of progressive moral universalism in which uh, general human improvement proceeded as an inevitable result from applying scientific rationalism to civil life. Civil life. So the, the goal I have for today is to try and kind of unpack some of the elements of the book uh, that I think helped to both flesh out how they developed their uh, uh, universalist vision in relation to the religions of the empire, uh, and then some of the ways that influenced the way they looked at colonized peoples. So I'm gonna start with, by talking about comparative religion. Um, and I think the, the discussion of comparative religion is 
to my mind, the sort of heart or spine of the book. It's from this that I think a lot else flows. Uh, and, and the free thinkers made heavy use of comparative religion from before secularism was coined as a term. So in the 1830s and 40s, we find it right through to the end of the period that I look at. I really leave off in the 1880s, but I have archival material running into the 20th century and I can draw in uh, or I can make the case that comparative religion remains relevant throughout. Um, early on, we see uh, the free thinkers make heavy use of enlightenment sources, especially French ones, uh, such as the Comte de Volnay and Charles Dupuis, uh, books like The Ruins of Empires, um, which make uh, are sort of these rather peculiar universal histories of religion that try and kind of uh, demonstrate how all of these different religions are, in fact, one uh, uh, rational um, out of one sort of rational pool. Um, they also uh, borrow heavily from East India Company Orientalists like Sir William Jones um, and others like Thomas Maurice. Um, and, and these imperial sources are very important. They also borrow from travel literature and other you know, sorts of documents that they can get their hands on. And beginning in the 1850s and 60s, you see uh, the use of the nascent uh, science of religion appearing in the secularist press. So intellectual uh, leaders like Friedrich Max Müller uh, and his work on the Rig Veda becomes really influential. Um, so to give an example of a kind of, uh, an early example of the, the, the role of comparative religion, um, I like to talk about Charles Southwell's atheistic periodical, The Oracle of Reason, which uh, first appeared in 1841. Um, and right from the outset, in the very first issue of the Oracle of Reason, um, right after uh, 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 Southwell has introduced his very long series on uh, um, talking about what we would call evolution now, which was still talked about as transmutation at the time, um, comes a series on uh, uh, religious symbols of the world and trying to kind of unpack the uh, religious sim symbolism of Hinduism as a way of looking at and understanding both Hinduism and to critique uh, Christianity. And in that uh, text, Charles Southwell uh, makes a frontal assault on the Christian apologetics of Orientalist um, scholars like Thomas Morris. Um, so these are people who are working for the East India Company in India and are uh, there to basically translate and interpret um, uh, Indian texts in such a way as to aid the East India, East India Company in its governance of India. And many of these scholars um, really struggled because they were devout Christians and they wanted to you know, relate uh, or at least show how Christianity remained true despite what you're finding in these um, uh, Sanskrit texts. And so Southwell attacks Maurice, declaring that his work greatly disfigured by an, un I'm quoting here, an unnecessary obtrusion of his religious opinions and gratuitous impertinences leveled against those whose orthodoxy is not his doxy, which I think is a very sort of charming line. Um, and, and the substance of what he comes out to is that, you know, uh, he, he very famously says the assumption, or I think it's very uh, at not famously, sorry, aptly says, the assumption of an Indian or Egyptian priest is just as good to our thinking as the assumption of a Christian priest. The claim of the Hindu philosophers for priority in point of time and moral su superiority may or may not be extravagant, but if they are extravagant, it should be exposed and not violate the plainest rules of justice and right reason by pronouncing them such just because they have the direct tendency of overthrowing the mosaic system and with it Christianity. Um, and, and I think this is, this is a sort of seminal line of argument that runs through the movement throughout. Um, George Jacob Holyoaks uh, took over editorship of the Oracle after um, another sort of set piece moment in the use of comparative religion, which is when Southwell was tossed in jail for blasphemy for publishing a really vituperative attack on biblical morality under the title of Jew Book, um, where he picks up all of the most aggressive anti-Semitic stereotypes of the period in order to attack uh, the Bible as an immoral text. And so Holyoke uh, takes over while Bradlaugh, or sorry, Southwell is in jail. Uh, and then he himself is thrown in jail. It's, it's a whole thing. Um, and, and that, um, the anti-Semitism of that 
um, text is it's frequently debated among scholars about how this goes, you know, because it seems very clear that Southwell's main project was to pick up on the most gratuitous, gratuitously anti-Jewish sentiment in order to make a very vehement point. Um, I don't think there's any way of getting around the fact that it is deeply anti-Semitic, but there are uh, complications in how we interpret the intentionality of what uh, people are up to there. But what I argue is that setting aside the intent, so what they, the individuals may have specifically thought about Jewish people, what I argue is that what we see in texts like that and others in the secularist press when they talk about Judaism is that there is a project of making Christianity strange by alienating Christianity, by making it seem more foreign. Um, in effect, by making Christianity seem more Jewish, it makes it seem less English and therefore not the natural and most uh, reasonable thing for the English people to orient themselves towards. And this is picking up on scholarship that looks at, say, German Orientalism in the 18th century, which were doing the same project of, um, as they call it, Judaizing Christianity as part of a project of biblical criticism. So this is a thread that runs through the 18th and 19th century of um, sort of re-entrenching the Jewish history of Christianity, some of it for Christian purposes, but in this case for anti-Christian purposes. Um, and all of this is to suggest that the, the point was to try and make Christianity seem basically more irrational, something that could be attacked, uh, and to estrange Christianity as something that could be set aside in favor of a more natural, rational, and universal morality. Um, so one of the avenues that they did this, um, so Judaism, attacking Judaism was one of the ways. Another way was to pick up on traditions from the East, such as Buddhism and Confucianism. So the secularists were looking around for a rational and empirical foundation uh, for ethics. Um, and one avenue for proving the non-theological basis of human morality was to try and derive evidence for common ethical arguments from across religious and cultural boundaries. So religious comparisons played a really important role in this. Um, and Buddhism and Confucianism were um, in, well, the, the Victorians in general got really obsessed with Buddhism. Uh, by the late 19th century, the, the, the Victorians had a real fascination with Buddhism and it feeds into the development of things like theosophy, but it begins a little bit earlier in the century and then somewhat naturally given the craze for Buddhism, um, the secularists pick up on it and they're like, well, we can make use of this too. So we first see Buddhism really getting a serious introduction to British readers in the 1830s. Um, and, um, you know, there's a, there's, I'm not gonna go into the scholarly debate about it, but there is a really uh, interesting debate about what this Buddhism that the British encountered was. I, I'm very influenced by the argument from, it's from the 1980s at this point, but um, that in effect, the Buddhism that the Victorians knew was a British Buddhism, that the, a bunch of British Protestants cast around to make a religion that had texts and creeds and something that looked like a religion to their eyes, packaged it together and like, here's this thing from the East called Buddhism. Uh, and that's what they understood. And the degree to which that has much in relation to what exists as practice in Asia is very limited. Uh, but in any case, the Buddhism, whatever that Buddhism was, the first time we see it appear in the free thinking press is in um, George Holyoke's uh, periodical, The Reasoner, in 1848-49, and a set of articles by a figure named T.W. Thornton. And Thornton describes Buddhism as, quote, a prototype of Christianism, uh, and that its similarities that they seem to see between Christianity and uh, Buddhism was because Buddhism, or sorry, Christianity owed debts to Buddhism. So to quote at length, uh, the first Roman Catholic missionaries who came in contact with the Buddhic religion were so struck with its numerous points of resemblance to their own that they could find no means of accounting for it except the sapient idea of attributing it to Satan, who must have instituted in a mockery in spite of the Christian system. Um, his response is actually that uh, Christianity must have basically, uh, the early Christians must have encountered uh, Buddhism in the Middle East in the first century, and therefore Christianity was basically just Buddhism uh, transferred to the West. Now this actually taps into a, a, a big debate that's going on in the period. Um, 
there's a, a scholar named Charles Schobels whose text um, Buddha and Buddhism, which appears in the mid century, made the argument that it was Buddhism that was an offshoot of Christianity, that in fact, early apostolic missionaries had crossed into India and had uh, uh, conveyed the faith there. And so we should understand Buddhism as a reflection of uh, Christian travels to the uh, East. Um, and you perhaps won't be surprised to learn that the free thinkers thought that was rubbish. Uh, so they said it was the other way around. Um, so in 1868, a, figure, a guy named Miles McSweeney published in Charles Bradlaugh's uh, periodical, The National Reformer, uh, and argued that the first century Pharisees, Sadducees, and Essenes were not in fact Jewish at all. The Pharisees and Sadducees were Pythagoreans and Epicureans, uh, while the Essenes, to all intents and purposes, were followers of Buddha. McSweeney argued that the Buddhist code of belief and conduct um, exactly uh, corresponds with the tenets of the Essenes at the times the Romans became masters of Syria, and from this sect or originated the Christian legend from whence comes the Christian and Jewish prophecies of the Old Test and New Testament. Uh, and I never worked it into the book because it's just like it's just such a funny aside. But there was another article I found that argued that you can tell that Christianity came from Buddhism because the uh, Catholics and Buddhist monks have similar looking hats, which is one of my favorite things I read in the entire researching of this book, the hats, the sartorial explanation of religious exchange. Um, so anyways, this idea of Christian debts to Eastern traditions wasn't just about uh, running down Christianity. It was concerned also with the tradition of moral universalism. Eastern traditions like Buddhism and also Confucianism uh, were really useful avenues for this theorization. Um, so the similarity between Christianity and Buddhism was attributed to the claim that Judah, Jesus, Buddha, and, the follow, uh, and all of their followers had simply captured natural truths. Um, and these truths would be better and more fully realized by stripping them of their theological accoutrements. Here you can see the 19th century freethinkers very much reflecting their 18th century enlightenment forebears. This is a very kind of 18th century line of argumentation. Um, and so the devaluation of revelation and scriptural history was a way in which the seculars used to, uh, to naturalize ethics. And another way was to identify atheism and secularism in these non-Western traditions. Again, there was a wide perception in the 19th century of Buddhism as an atheistic religion. And the free thinking press was quite happy to pick this up. Um, uh, a figure, a guy named Malthus Questful Ryle in the 1840s published in Holyoke's uh, newspaper, The Movement, a text called The Chinese and Their Religion. And he argued that the Eastern traditions of Confucianism, Buddhism, and Taoism were all species of Epicurean philosophy. And he claims that um, these atheistical, uh, that the atheistical doctrines that could be found in Buddha uh, were the moral and morals and philosophy too, by the same account, were all tinctured with atheism. And Royal drew from this observation the conclusion that atheism was not a barrier to the maintenance of civil society. Again, that's an enlightenment argument. Um, arguing that it must, however, be conceded that no Eastern nation had surpassed the Chinese people for polite accomplishments, decorum, and the courtesies of life. So for an earlier generation of radicals like Thomas Paine and, and Robert Owen, who had drawn more from a deistic uh, sense of religious universalism, that there was a rational religion, this became for the free thinkers the challenge, uh, the idea that th there was no need for faith at all, uh, and that this was not necessary to civil peace. Quoting again at length, the very idea of God as creating or in any way ruling the world is utterly absent from the Buddhist system. God is not so much denied as he is simply not known, and et cetera, et cetera, arguing that uh, the Buddhist nations, the Chinese, Mongols, and Tibetans have no word even in their languages to express the notion of God. So by the 1870s, this vision of a precocious Eastern secularism was entrenched. Uh, and in, a, in an on, anonymous article in the secularist periodical Secular Review, British Christianity is now recast as the minority position. To quote, secularism may appear in this country um, as but a small or despised sect, uh, but in the world at large, it comprises at least one third of its inhabitants, for there is a fundamental agreement between secularism and Buddhism. 
Similarly, uh, another article from the same periodical published a year later argued that the so-called divine revelations of Christianity and Mohammedanism are not fit to be compared with the apparently complex yet really simple system of the light of Asia. And above all, Buddhism is secularism because it teaches us that within ourselves lies all potentialities of amelioration. So reading things like Buddhism and to a less degree Confucianism as forms of antique secularism allow the secularists, uh, gave the secularist critics um, something that was very useful. They already had ancient foundations for what they took to be secular principles, Epicureanism in particular. But with uh, things like Buddhism, they found something with ancient roots that was still extant in the world. And so they were able to say, look, so in addition to that, we can say that free thought is a, has a long tradition dating back to the Greeks. We can also show that it is not something that has been rid from the world. And in fact, uh, civilized societies outside of Europe are already secularists. And so, you know, Britain should be too. Um, and through this process, they work to naturalize their claims to morality uh, and in the process, naturalize their, uh, their idea of progress. Um, however, progress does face impediments. And this is where we have to circle back around to some of the, the English context here. Um, the, as I was saying before, the secularism grew out of a, 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 a working class artisan radical tradition dating back to the 1790s. Um, and what you see in there is in, in the secularist tradition is very much an obsession with a artisan or working class self-defense against tyranny. In this case, tyranny of religion, of priestcraft, and of the crown and the aristocracy. Um, and um, the, the, the most powerful armor uh, against this tyranny was education. Uh, and so education was vital for unlocking progress. Progress may be innate, but it has to be, you know, the impediments have to be worked around. And um, as a self-defense against tyranny, education was a process of training the individual to embrace both liberty and responsibility. To quote from Holyoke, in practicing free thought, there may be passion, but not petulance, enthusiasm, but not excitement. It must be patient, persistent, and independent and seek two things, truth and deliverance, and the sign of deliverance is independence. And so a rationalist education in this formulation would produce a variety of progressive results. Uh, some of these are really quite astonishingly like utopian. So uh, coming from one of Holyoke's papers, not written by him, it's an anonymous author, but this is published in one of Holyoke's papers. Uh, it declares, men will be free from superstitious terrors and from needless religious anxieties anxieties, hatred and horror of each other will disappear, and the world would constantly be more, become more beautiful and man more glorious, life would be more happy, and death itself would be stripped of both its agonies and its fears. So this is what education will do. Um, but it's the content of education is really important. And what we see is that the the free thinkers are aggressively oppose religious education and fight tooth and nail for secular education throughout the 19th century. Um, constantly disappointed, uh, you still see them writing into the 1920s and uh, 30s about how um, the Anglican um, tradition and the, the church has still got too much of a hand in, in education. Uh, I don't think they're necessarily wrong, but yeah, th that's that's the how it goes. Um, so, you know, is in the 1850s, we see arguments like that the Bible is made to use to block up the avenues of knowledge, uh, or another quote, uh, that exalted Christian wisdom tells the reader that the arts of reading, writing, and arithmetic cannot be taught, nor the uh, moral duties of humanity inculcated, except in the company with the Pentateuch and the four Gospels. And this is a running theme. I've got that from 1850 almost verbatim similar arguments I've got from 1867, 73, 77, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I'll not bore you with it. So one of the questions though, that has to be under, uh, figured out is, is secular religion neutral or does the content of secularity imply something that is different or antagonistic to Christian faith? So to be secular, does one have to be transformed from a Christian? Now, as I would argue, uh, say, Charles Bradlaugh would argue largely that yes, but the Holyoke uh, uh, tradition argues that secularism is in fact a neutral ground. 
Um, Holyoke argues that there is a difference between a secular education and a secularist education. Um, uh, Michael Rechtenwald, who's a scholar of the movement, calls this form of secularism a suspensive category, a neutral space for social and political um, cooperation. Um, and this perspective informed Holyoke's view of secularism as both for religious and non-religious. So for example, um, he insisted, Holyoke insisted, during the period uh, around when W.B. Forster was drafting the 1870 Education Act, Holyoke took to, pr took to print to argue that knowledge which is secular is not, as many imagine it, necessarily opposed to that which is religious. It is merely distinct from it. Uh, he also argued that um, a secular form of state compulsory education would, quote, satisfy the most extreme person in England of either a religious or an anti-religious bent. The implication was that while settling the education problem using a secular state model, religious sensitivities might still be accommodated. Um, he's never successful in arguing this. And I think, you know, in the enduring debates between secular education and uh, uh, particularly with, say, religious fundamentalists, some of that debate about what is the content of a secular education and what is its relation to as a neutral ground remains open. And this concern or this issue is carried forth into the imperial field. This is where we sort of need to turn and look at what's going on in the empire. Um, and the set piece I want to talk about here is um, the 1857 rebellion in India, which was a, a massive uh, a rebellion that shook the foundations of British rule there, uh, ended the East India Company's rule, so it begins the era of direct British rule over India, um, and was one of these moments that really focused a lot of attention on the empire amongst people uh, in England um, who sometimes, you know, it was on the periphery of their imagination or suddenly, well, now we all have a debate about India. Um, so 1857-58 is a real high point for these sorts of things. And for Holyoke and the secularists, uh, and echoing a line that's common amongst a lot of liberals at the time, um, secular education was vital for creating civil peace in India. Um, and it would do so specifically by mitigating Indian fears of Christianization. Um, the, the benefits of this would be, uh, were, the, the benefits of this were clearly enunciated. Um, secularism offered a means of defense and advance against superstition. And for Holyoke, it was a, a vital question of how the English state, with millions of only nominal Christians at homes at home and millions more non-Christians in its empire, would govern its subject in order to subjects in order to achieve progress. So to quote from Holyoke here, he says, the Christian minister can only raise expensive funds and convert them one by one, but whole generations must meanwhile pass to eternal perdition, perdition before the words of the gospel can reach them. The Christian has nothing to say to these people, but secularism says that there are principles independent of Christianity, which derived from nature and experience can be commended by reason and which them address themselves to the people of all languages, climes, and professions of religion. So secularism and state, uh, secular state education were, in Holyoke's view, important for all the citizens of the British Empire. In addressing colonial subjects in the same breath as artisan and laboring infidels in Britain, Holyoke was trying to shorten the distance between the colony and the metropole by bringing them together and orienting them both towards an as yet future state of progress. And this is again, uh, one of the interesting things that I find in the free thinking press is that they're much like the liberals of their time. So John Stuart Mill and others who have often a quite condescending view of the colonies and the free thinkers often have a quite condescending view of colonial subjects as well. But at the same time, because of their minority status and often their plebeian status, they're, they're not as content about the civilized status of England either, right? So it's, it's aristocratic, it's tyrannical, it's not itself as progressive as it could be. And I think that element that comes through in their writing really leaps out in some of the debates around education. Um, And one of the big targets for the uh, secularists then were the missionaries. They, they really disliked the missionaries and the missionaries were uh, a common target for them. Um, usually the way that uh, the missionaries are depicted in the secularist press are as charlatans, fanatics, frauds, or usually all three. 
um, and and they they don't get they don't come off well. Uh, and so secularist antipathy for missions was grounded in both opposition to Christian social power at home and their vision of a successful overseas civilizing mission. So the sense that emerges in the free thinking press is that imperial mismanagement arose from the distortion of Britain's positive civilizing mission by Christian zealots and missionaries. So they argue that the reason that you get violence in India to begin with is because of efforts at Christianization. Again, this is a fairly common liberal argument, um, but you know the secularists obviously have kind of organizational reasons for landing on it. Um, in early 1858, the reasoner carried an article uh, from uh, reporting on a speech Holyoke gave where he declared that he thought views better than Christianism might prevail and that Holyoke objected to the manner in which Christians were proposed to extend it in India and extended uh, that uh, the manner in which it had hitherto been intended to be extended had proved a great source of irritation to the natives. Um, but even before 1857, the, the free thinkers had pinned administrative and civil, civil unrest in India on Christian arrogance. Uh, two years earlier, uh, there had been an article in the, uh, again, in the Reasoner, arguing that hatred for the conversion of children had been the inciting incident behind, quote, that gentlest and meekest of mobs, a Hindu mob, unquote. Um, and argued that uh, Indian civil unrest was the cumulative effect of the outrages inflicted upon Indians by Christian authorities and Christian missionaries. So um, this view of missionary responsibility for the Indian uprising of 1857, um, like I said, was not really unusual for liberals. You'll see this in other liberals at the time, um, so many of whom are free thinkers or free thinker adjacent. So Harriet Martineau, the liberal reformer, makes a similar argument. Um, but the, 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 the missionaries remain the ultimate culprits. But that doesn't stop the uh, um, secularists from, at the outset, attacking the Indians. So you, you do see the, the face of the imperial condescension come in pretty aggressively right at the outset. So, you know, Holio uh, writes in the, his paper that mercy is murder until the Sepoy savages are disarmed. After that, uh, punishment without retaliation is all that Britain will ask. And he makes uh, declarations about the fundamental difference between the Sepoy nature and British nature. He says we're just totally different. Um, and then you see similar articles uh, coming out about the uh, fanaticism of Muslim and Brahmin uh, and, and that how these things sent a shudder through every civilized land. Um, and, and again, the initial response to 1857 was quite violent, but most liberals very quickly kind of reverted to form and focused on uh, reforms for the British. Um, and so, yeah, Holyoke and Ainsley argued that British policy and conduct in the colonies was ultimately to blame for the violence. So they echoed positivists like Richard Congreve and Frederick Harrison and liberal free thinkers like Harriet Martineau. Um, and they argued that, uh, it was Ainsley and Holyoke, that the British presence in India was illegitimate, at least that its fundamental uh, uh, basis was illegitimate, but nevertheless, they were there, so they should rule, so the goal should be better rule, so more competent management. And this better management turned upon denying the missionaries converts. Forestalling Christianization was the key to unleashing progress. Um, and I'm coming to the end here, I won't take too much longer. Uh, by the way, I'm not going on and on. But the comparison here uh, is where we can start to see some of the ideas around the limits of progress and the way in which race and um, uh, religion intersects with ideas of progress. So Holyoke, in talking about secularization for India, looked at and compared India to the state of uh, Black Americans uh, in the United States. And he said, the people of India are entitled to freedom and free institutions. The aspirations of liberty and self-government should be cherished among them. Uh, these, uh, the secular principles avowed by leading British statesmen will foster and develop. The Christianizing principles of those who seek the conversion of India will throw the people back into submission. Um, Christianity, as evangelicals preach it, will do to the Hindu what it has done for the Negro. Um, he then recites an ex horrendously uh, racist poem, which I am not going to read on the internet, uh, but 
he says, we certainly hope that the people of India, as they throw off the superstitions which have hitherto enslaved them, will not suffer the less uh, gross but still misleading superstitions of Christianity to continue the bondage of the mind. So against the Christian bondage of the mind, the secularists proposed to progress through the advance of reason. But what they don't address, so they've got this thing, but they, what they have is this set, secular neutral ground, but they don't talk about the content of it. What does the secular demand of Indian Muslims, Indian Sikhs, Indian Hindus in the British educational mode? Um, and do they expect the um, uh, Indians to be transformed? And I don't have a full answer to this. I'm never able to uncover it because basically right when it comes down to the brass tacks of what is the Indian supposed to be like, it just ends with the rational individual, which of course, um, as post-colonial and, and various other critical scholars would point out, that does imply radical social and cultural change, but the free thinkers never really engaged that answer. And I don't think they necessarily could have for the time. Um, there's a conceptual uncertainty. But what we do see is that the free thinkers do gladly take up the idea that they might have missionaries themselves. Um, so it's suggested in 1861 that they should send, uh, uh, they, that Britons and free thinkers the world over would rush to fund the employment of the active means for the propagation of secular knowledge in India, tending of course to uproot the popular superstitions, leaving nothing in their place, which I think is su suggestive of what would be happening here. So for Holyoke, this act of negation would be a revolutionary boon for India. Nothing would benefit it more, he says, uh, and that uh, an India which thirsts for the knowledge of this life unalloyed by superstition. So in their advocacy for secular policies of reform in India, we can discern a desire to extend their ideas of progress abroad, while at the same time expressing you know, ideas for the transformation of society at home. So the empire serves secularist interests in being rhetorically useful. Um, and that's largely what I've kind of focused on here. But one last thing I wanna just pick up on before I finish is how does all this tie in with um, race? Since race and empire is a kind of master subject for understanding the 19th century. Um, and in this respect, there's a book that came out a couple of years ago from a colleague of mine named Nathan Alexander. And he and I have come to very similar conclusions, which is that there's just a deep vein of ambiguity that runs through 19th century secularism's interaction with ideas of biological race and racialism. Um, some of the free thinkers embrace it and you see them writing extensively uh, on anthropological subjects and on innate racial difference. Um, but for most of the movement that I've been able to track, um, you see a lot of an, uh, um, ambivalence about the idea of biological race. They are fundamentally universalists. They don't really want to buy into the idea that there is innate racial hierarchies. Um, they're quite happy to be cultural imperialists in the sense that, you know, they see a hierarchy of culture and civilization, but they, most of them are very uncomfortable with the idea of biological racialism. However, I think one of the things that we can uh, track in how this plays out is the way in which um, the sense that a community might be rational in its form of religion uh, can influence racialist language. So in the 1860s, there is a lengthy series on the history of Islam published in the National Reformer by a figure named Peter Fox. And I won't try and unpack the whole text, uh, but the very close of it, uh, says this about Islam. It's a bit of a long quote, but bear with me. The faith of Islam still holds might and absolute sway over the multitudes of Asia and Africa. These Persian, Turkish, and Egyptian gentlemen are excellent secularists. They acknowledge our superior power in the art of war. They admire our industry. They want our steam, steam engines, our railways, our telegraphs, our canals, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Out of deference to us, they will shave off their patriarchal beards and assume our Frankish costume. But the one thing they will not do is they will not touch our religion. They scorn our orthodox, the orthodox theology. Um, educated in a Unitarian faith, they will abandon it whenever they do abandon it not for Trinitarianism, but for deism, not for Christianity, but for secularism. And with this disposition of theirs, you and I, the free thinkers of the West, have no fault. 
So in this sense, the, the progressive characteristic of Islam is there because it seems to look like Unitarianism, which seems to be amenable to secularizing towards secularism. In contrast, in the late 1870s, um, the leader that succeeded Charles Bradlaugh, uh, G.W. Foote, um, cast his eye over the Maori King movement in Aotearoa, New, Zo New Zealand, and the role of a Christian prophetic tradition in the Maori King movement. And for Foote, looking at this uh, role in which an Old Testament prophetic form of Christianity became deeply integrated in a Maori opposition to colonization was clear evidence that the Maori were destined to racial extinction. So he declares that, O oh, Te Witi, your fine mind has been besotted and deluded by the Christian book of missionaries. Thy supernatural power is but a broken reed. Thy prophecies fall harmless like those of many prophets before thee, and thy messiahship is a dream. Jesus could not save the Jews, nor canst thou save the Maoris. There is no help. The race is to the swift and the battle to the strong. So you see very, very different reactions here from people roughly within the same wing of the movement. So what I would argue then is that one component of the ambiguous secular response to ideas of race, racial difference, and racial superiority lay in the way secularists perceive Christianity itself as a barrier to progress. Um, that's not an answer by itself. There's more going on. There's ideological commitments and philosophical commitments, but I think it's part of it. It's part of the story. So progress expressed as a self-defense of overcoming of superstitious authority is a recurring theme throughout secularist thought, and it's worth considering as part of what constituted the limits of progress as the Victorian thinkers imagined their secularist world. And thank you very much, and I hope I haven't gone too long there. Great.